So I'll be presenting on long-term change in, uh, I suppose, contamination risks to groundwater and groundwater quality, hence the past, present and future title. And I'm presenting really on behalf of a couple of colleagues in Kenya, uh, one at Jaramoji Oginga Odinga University and the other in Vired International, who unfortunately can't make the presentation because of connectivity issues. Okay, so let me give a little bit of background to this, this talk. Um, as we know, the urban population is set to increase to 1.2 billion by 2050 in sub-Saharan Africa. And a lot of population growth is actually focused around the Lake Victoria Basin area. Um, there's maybe a general pattern where you'd argue that piped utility water coverage lags behind that growth. And so as a consequence, people in informal settlements quite often rely on, on shallow groundwaters, hand dug wells, uh, to supplement pipe water. Alongside that, with people often using on-site sanitation because they're off-grid, um, there's concomitant uh, contamination risks that go with that. I'm conscious this is an urban topic and I'm talking to a rural water supply network. And although I'll be talking about urban areas, you could imagine these issues potentially could affect surrounding rural areas, small towns, peri-urban areas. So the focus is around urban growth and the way that affects groundwater safety and quality. So more specifically, uh, what we've focused, been focused on in this part of our catalyst has been um, the way in which groundwater contamination risks have changed in response to urbanization and the way that water quality has changed in response to urbanization. And alongside a sort of long-term look at those two questions in a couple of case study sites, uh, we've also been looking at the question of what might urban groundwater domestic use look like in these areas by 2030. So our case study sites Kasumu, Kenya's third largest city. And within that site, we've been focused on two informal settlements, uh, Manyatare and Magosi on the eastern side of the city, both, both of which have been around for some time. And as you'll see in both settlements from the statistics there, um, the census would suggest that there is a lot of uh, use of hand dug wells and a lot of on-site sanitation use. So if you like, if we start with the past end of the past, present and future, um, what we've done in this project is to just draw on some data from historic projects by Vired International in Kenya and Surrey um, and use those as a sort of baseline for looking at long-term change. So Vired International were involved in generating a map of um, wells and buildings and sanitation um, back in 1999 in the two um, settlements that I was talking about. So you can see a sample of one of those maps on the right. And if you look, the red dots on that map are representing the locations of pit latrines, whilst the blue dots on that map are generally representing the locations of wells. So that's one of our baselines, and you'll also notice the black outlines of buildings on that well, on, on that map. On top of that, uh, subsequently, between 2002 and 2004, my colleagues at Surrey and Vired also carried out um, sanitary risk inspection and water quality testing and a sample, on a sample of 51 of the blue dots that you can see on the right-hand side and in fact a borehole as well. So the kind of parameters they were testing for would be the sort of markers you might expect with uh, fecal contamination. So microbiologically thermotolerant coliforms, nitrate, chloride, and electroconductivity. So moving to the present now, what we did was almost to try and replicate some of that work as, as far as we possibly could. So to update um, the mapping work, we conducted a transect survey where we recorded both wells and pit latrines relative to that original 1999 map along two transects which were randomly generated. Alongside that, we also updated the buildings map 
from high spatial resolution satellite imagery by, by visually interpreting it using an image from 2013. And then we went back to the same sample of wells again and again attempted the sanitary risk inspection using the same checklist of possible hazards and also went back and tested for the same water quality parameters once again. And finally, if I move to the sort of future side of the business, um, to look at what might potentially happen by 2030, we convened, if you like, an expert panel of around 20 people um, earlier this year. And then that panel uh, were presented with uh, a series of, of informative presentations, both about the current water situation, also about plans for the uh, water and sanitation utility locally, um, and also using a piece of software called International Futures. And in fact, the diagram you can see on the right-hand side there, that graph is an output from a piece of software that generates national level predictions under future scenarios. So the red line represents unimproved uh, water access. The green line represents piped water access with other improved in yellow. And there are different scenarios on that right-hand side. So that was part of the information these people were given. On the back of that, if you like, information package to inform our expert panel, we then asked them to map out in a series of breakout groups uh, patterns of likely sanitation, uh, domestic water access, and also population density uh, were things to continue under the current uh, situation. OK. So let's now move a little bit forward to what we actually found. And let's start with the changes in the bilk environment. So on the left-hand side here, what we see is a map of buildings from the 1999 baseline. And on the right-hand side, the same picture for 2013. And if you look at the top there in particular, the actual amount of area occupied by buildings has in fact more than doubled over that period perhaps less so in the lower half of that study area, but nonetheless quite an intensification of the settlement pattern. I'll present a little bit of photographic evidence as well. Um, here's one of these shallow hand dug wells from 2004, and the same well in 2013. Not very much change on that one. If I move on, on the other hand, and mention the borehole that originally was part of our sample uh, back in 2004. Uh, there is in 2004. By 2013, that's no longer working. And indeed, the replacement borehole that had gone in subsequently also no longer working. So quite a mixed pattern of change, just uh, qualitatively through the photos. Let's see some more quantitative data on, on the changes now. And these are our Transact survey results. So what we have here is on the left-hand side in blue, we've got some information about the well distribution and how that's changed along the transects. And on the right-hand side, we have pit latrines and how they've changed along the transects. And if you were to have a look there, the left-hand bar are the number of wells present both in our baseline and when we went back this year. The middle bar shows the number of, well, of wells or pit latrines that have disappeared. And the right-hand bar shows new wells that have appeared by 2014, or pit latrines, that weren't there in the baseline. So what you can see actually along the transect is that the number of pit latrines and indeed wells has actually both increased. If we move on further, you might then ask yourselves about sanitary risk. And here we have the number of hazards identified through a sanitary risk inspection during the baseline survey, and then once again during the follow-up survey. And if you notice there, there's a sort of tail of low risks that's disappeared, and there's a little bit of a shift across to the right-hand side. And you can imagine that being to do in part with the uh, uh, pit latrine picture that we just saw. So that's the built environment. What about the water quality? Uh, well, I'll focus on just a couple of parameters here. 
Um, we talked about thermotolerant coliforms, and we actually took repeat measures of those from 2002 to 2004 uh, in the baseline. In fact, fairly mixed picture. It's a little bit hard to discern very much going on there. And if we were to sort of test for significance on the left-hand side, we're seeing the baseline situation. And on the right-hand side, we're seeing the follow-up situation this year. And if you were to look at those two graphs, it's a little bit hard, really, to pick out much of a pronounced change there. In contrast, the nitrate work at the bottom of that slide, where, um, um, if you like, our, our, our baseline work was concentrated in a short period. Actually, what's happened there is there does seem to have been a perhaps contradictory drop in the uh, uh, nitrates, uh, nitrate as nitrogen uh, levels within the water over the period. So that's apparently contradictory. However, were we to have a look at this um, in a more robust way, controlling for um, um, other apparent drivers of contamination in these shallow wells, most notably rainfall, and if we were to fit a multivariate model of, of um, um, contamination that takes into account rainfall, what happens is we find a pronounced effect of rainfall on the uh, levels of, of, of nitrate in the wells. Um, but also, we then will start to see that the change in the baseline is much more nuanced. So in fact, actually, it seems to be that we're not seeing such a clear-cut and obvious effect of the baseline relative to um, uh, higher levels at the baseline relative to follow-up uh, after we control for rainfall probably because in that 2004 period, there was much higher rainfall going on than we had in our follow-up. So rather more nuance there. What about the future situation? Well, this is a, just a little snippet of the kind of work that we've been doing, uh, looking at our groups and, and what, they might, what they told us about what they believed future patterns of domestic water use might look, might look like. And we've got two graphic hits here from two different groups, one on the pessimistic side and one on the more optimistic side. And um, if we were to look at the groups here, um, one thing that you'll notice in both is that the colors represent the sort of mix of water that we might see by 2030 forecast by our groups. And you'll notice that the green actually covers pipe water. In fact, the green isn't ubiquitous in, in the map of Kasumu that we have here. So you can see that actually there are, there are sort of areas of mixed in the, in the hatching on the right-hand side where people would be relying not just on pipe water but on other sources such as groundwater as well. So one pattern is that I think everyone is telling us that the um, uh, pipe water isn't ubiquitous by 2030. And on top of that, the sort of urban core of Kasumu, which is the sort of right-hand, um, which is uh, in, the, in the center of that graphic, there's quite a lot of consistency over what people are saying about, about, about that area and much less consistency about the surrounding areas. So if we were to sort of summarize some of the sort of patterns we're seeing here, what we're seeing as is apparent from the transect surveys is that groundwater use seems to remain significant alongside on-site sanitation. And that's backed us by some of the participatory workshops we've had alongside this. It also looks as though we're seeing an intensification of contamination risks for these shallow groundwaters. The uh, groundwater quality results are maybe not quite so clear cut, but at least with the water chemistry, that could be likely because of a, a high rainfall during our baseline period. If we look beyond into the future, it seems as though our panel are telling us that domestic urban groundwater use continues as part of the supply mix. And in general, actually looking across all the groups and all of the questions we pose to them, there was more certainty about the future of high income areas. So some sort of questions that maybe might be ones for discussion later. Um, We've focused on an urban area and, uh, because that's where the, the, the data were, the baseline data were, and we're seeing this exacerbated contamination risk, we think. You might ask yourselves, 
what might be happening in small towns and peri-urban areas more relevant to the rural water supply mix? Um, are, 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 is the change there likely to be even greater? I think the other question you might ask is, um, uh, where are these areas where we're seeing this mix of shallow hand dug wells and um, um, also on-site sanitation and high population densities? Uh, leaving aside our case studies, where exactly are these areas? And finally, if we're thinking about approaches for managing urban water safety, we picked up and used, for example, a sanitary risk form that came out of the back of the WHO guidelines for hand dug wells, and we used that for compatibility with our baseline. However, um, I would maybe question how well adapted that is for use in an urban setting. For example, does that form really pick up the leaky sewerage pipe that you might see in one of these urban settings that you wouldn't necessarily see in a rural setting? So I think there's a number of kind of questions that come out of this that perhaps we could pick up later. But I'll maybe stop at this point and hand back to the, the chair.